Hi everyone. Hi, good night. Uh, well, welcome once again to the Resident Member Series and one other Monday night, especially with how cold it is. Tonight we have uh, Michael. Almost all of us know Michael. <laughs> He's a second year <clears throat> master student in the um, Archival Studies and Library and Information Studies at UBC <laughs> School of Information, and he's also been working since 2022 in the school in the Dialogue Center here at UBC. And today he's gonna tell us a bit more about uh, what he's been doing for this year and a half, and especially on how on his work on human-centered uh, archival studies. So please welcome our friend Michael. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you all for coming. Uh, here's my plan for tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'll give an introduction to the archival profession, specifically in the English-speaking world. And then I'll talk about human-centered archival practice and three frameworks of particular interest to me for pursuing human-centered archival practice. And then I have three case studies I'd like to show you about. One is my current workplace, the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. And then there are two other um, really cool institutions doing interesting stuff that I'd love to share. Uh, Australia's Find and Connect resource for people who were in out-of-home care as children, and UCLA Special Collections Redescription Project for holdings documenting the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. So this is also kind of a content warning that these are the topics that will be covered, but I'll say that I'm not going to go into detail about the histories of these communities. Um, this is going to be more from the perspective of archival studies in terms of like policies of archival institutions in terms of how they handle records of these histories. Um, and then there will be time for questions at the end, but also feel free to interject with questions throughout, especially if something is unclear. Uh, so a little bit about me. I grew up a few hours from here in Penticton on Okanagan territory. Um, and then I did my undergrad and a master's in English at the University of Victoria uh, on the Kwangan territory over on Vancouver Island. And currently, as Pedro said, I'm a dual student in archival studies and library and information studies here on Musqueam territory, where I also work as a collections assistant at the Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Um, and as a non-Indigenous person, I'm very grateful to have lived and worked in these lands and to be able to um, be in these spaces. Uh, so the archival profession in the English-speaking world. Um, you can go back however far you'd like to go back, but for this talk, I'll just go back to the French Revolution. Um, so in the English-speaking world, um, we take a lot of our archival traditions from Europe, and a big turning point in the history of the archival profession was the French Revolution because it caused a separation in, uh, between records of the current government that was newly established and the records of the Ancien Regime. So in Europe, prior to the French Revolution, um, archives were held by ruling institutions, and there was less of a distinction between our, uh, records in active use and historical records. So that changed with the French Revolution. And over the course of the 19th century, the profession of archives uh, became increasingly well professionalized as, as practicing archivists were writing manuals and working out problems in terms of how to deal with historical records no longer in active use by governments. Um, and two principles emerged for practical reasons in this period that are still very influential today. One is the idea of respect des fonds, um, fond meaning like a collection of records, um, and that is the idea that records are grouped according to their creating agencies, so the creating government agencies, and they are not intermixed with the records of other creating agencies. And the second principle was the principle of respect for original order, which means that once records are no longer in active use by a government agency, they are transferred to the archives and the archivist organizes the records according to how they were organized by their creating agencies. You can see how these principles grew out of practical concerns because it is, because it is much easier to simply maintain the organizational system of records as they arrive to you on the archival threshold rather than rearranging records, for example, by topic. And that's a big difference between the archival profession and the library profession. 
Archives typically deal with aggregations of records and with collections, whereas libraries typically deal with items. And items can be arranged and rearranged according to any number of different organizational systems. Um, whereas with archives, there's a sense that um, archive, like records are arranged in a particular order and that that order itself is part of the collection. Um, however, these principles assumed two key things. One was that government agencies had good record keeping systems, and this was definitely true of certain contexts in 19th century Europe. So for example, Prussia had a very ordered, um, good record keeping system with its registrar system, and so there was really no need to rearrange records. They already came to the archives very well organized. Um, and the other assumption is that maintaining a government agency's record keeping system will in fact be useful and be a good representation of the agency itself. So those are the assumptions that were in place at the time that archival practices became standardized in ways that we are still beholden to today in the way that government records are organized. However, in the early 20th century and throughout the 20th century, a lot of things happened to kind of destabilize or at least put tension on these practices. One was the massive increase in the number of records generated by governments um, because of the world wars, because of the rise of welfare states, etc. Um, and as well, government agencies became ex increasingly much more bureaucratically complex, which made it much more difficult to actually apply these, former, these 19th century principles in practice. So what happened was these 19th century practical manuals were reimagined as archival theory that could be scaled to massive amounts of records. Um, so the principles um, became, they went from kind of practical, sort of like what makes sense to deal with these records to sort of like, okay, we need like a theory that actually is going to be useful like as these massive amounts of records are accumulating. Um, and so one of the things that happened was as records became more kind of disorganized and chaotic, um, archivists decided, oh, well, this principle of original order that records should reflect um, government agencies uh, functions and structure, that can actually be just conceptual rather than literal. So you, what you can do is actually you can just, as an archivist, do a functional analysis of the different functions carried out by government agencies, and you can actually just rearrange the records according to those functional, um, the, the sort of conceptual functional structures. And what that meant was that actually, even though this principle originally meant um, like that archivists were maintaining the order that records came in in the archives. As a result, that meant that archivists were rearranging records when they came into the archives. And that was actually kind of not entirely clear in the way that archivists were um, representing how they were handling records. Um, because throughout the 20th century, there was archivists sort of position themselves as neutral figures, simply preserving the records and revealing the truth of the records. But in fact, they were actually doing a lot of rearranging. Um, and you know, as uh, record systems became more complex, uh, individual archival institutions sort of prioritized selection, like what to keep and preservation, how to keep it, over public access to records. Um, and access to records became intended really for trained historians. And there was a sense that if a trained historian wanted to come into the archives and consult records, that they would probably need to consult with a reference uh, archivist. Um, so really they were not doing what libraries were doing, which was developing like information retrieval systems and classification systems. Um, what they were doing was basically relying on their internal collection guides as external facing guides to their collections, since there was a sense that um, like any uh, historians were gonna have to be consulting a reference uh, archivist anyway. And so that kind of just resulted in uh, a little bit of messiness. Um, and so then with the advent of the digital age, everything moving online, that created complications for archives because basically this sort of messy analog idiosyncratic system had to get moved online, um, which was done in a sense, except that, as I said, um, it was challenging to really harness like the affordances of digital technology because it was just this analog system that was just sort of awkwardly moved online. Um, I don't have anything to say about postmodernism. I just didn't take it off the slides. But <laughs> um, and then truth and reconciliation commissions were happening, where you know, with the um, like decolonization processes over the course of the 20th century, and people kind of looking back on like ma massive human rights abuses, there was um, 
uh, a, a bit of a reckoning of what the archivist's role was in these like colonial systems. And so the current state of the field, as I said, analog archival systems have moved online but struggle to harness the affordances of digital technology for information retrieval in the way that library systems have been more successful. Old assumptions about records, for example, even the idea of originality or the idea of a distinction between active and inactive records, no longer apply as much in the digital age. Uh, archival systems continue to prioritize the interests of record creators and academic historians over the interests of record subjects. Um, and then there's an, increasingly call in, there's an increasing call within and outside of the profession for archivists to discard this former kind of posturing of neutrality and to instead adopt a stance of like deliberate anti-colonialism, social justice, etc. And uh, in general, there's an increasing attention to basically the human side of archival work. So rather than thinking of archivists, or rather than archivists thinking of themselves as these sort of historian-trained, um, kind of staid, neutral handmaids of history, there's more interest in access to records, in record subjects, in records and trauma, and so forth. And so that is why my talk is on human-centered archival practice. Um, so Archivaria is the leading archival studies journal in Canada, and in 2021 they um, put out a call for a special for papers for a special issue on person-centered archival theory and praxis, and they define person-centered archival praxis, uh, or here what I'm calling human-centered archival practice, as broadly theory that shifts attention from the record to the people that keep that create, keep, use, and or are represented in records, and so. Ideas of radical empathy, affect, intimacy, the body, disability, dismantling white supremacy, indigenization, ethics of care, and many other kind of critical and liberatory ideas are making their way into archival studies in very exciting ways. And um, that is enacted through things like reparative description and redescription, takedown policies, trauma-informed approaches, and other kinds of approaches that I'll get into in a little more detail. Uh, so for today, I want to talk about three frameworks, as I said, for pursuing um, person-centered, human-centered archival practice. And then after that, I'll talk about three particular institutions and what they're doing. Uh, so reconciliation frameworks, or frameworks for pursuing kind of truth and reconciliation and um, like the legacy of colonialism and the ways that information institutions can better serve indigenous communities. Um, this is something that the museum profession kind of led prior to the archival profession in the sense that museums really had to grapple with um, re repatriation of holdings to indigenous communities. And to a certain extent, archives also have to grapple with the idea that holdings really belong, like certain holdings more rightfully belong to indigenous communities. Um, but more broadly, archival settings have taken up reconciliation frameworks for thinking about the ways that indigenous communities have historically been underserved by, archi by archival institutions, but also the ways that archival systems themselves kind of um, support uh, colonialism and, and, and the oppression of indigenous communities. Um, so I'll maybe, how much time? Okay, um, so reconciliation frameworks. Australia has sort of led ahead of North America in this regard. In 1995, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Library and Information Resource Network protocols were developed in response to a national inquiry. Um, the protocols were updated and are currently guiding archival practice. Um, one of the things that um, the protocols recommend is in relation to offensive language in archival holdings. Um, so what they recommend is that archival institutions in include offensive language in their descriptions. So not in the record itself, but in like the metadata describing the records. Um, for, so you know the metadata of records, you have the title, you have the description. So the title of a record could contain offensive language. So the issue of reproducing that offensive language in metadata, the protocols suggest um, uh, not erasing that offensive language, keeping it for the sake of transparency, but um, supplementing that outdated language with um, more updated terms that are kind of indexed using thesauri um, created with the input of indigenous peoples. And then in the US, in response to the relative success of Atzalern, a working group created um, the Protocols for Native American Archival Materials, which is now um, officially endorsed by the Society of American Archivists. 
Um, and they similarly have recommendations for what to do about basically collections that contain traumatic content, offensive content. Um, although they differ slightly in that they recommend replacing outdate, outdated terms and then just using square brackets to indicate that there was an, in, an intervention made. In Canada, um, our history um, has been more around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was formed as a mandated aspect of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. As I said, I won't go into the history of uh, Indian residential school system, although if people have questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but um, one of the results of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was 94 calls to action to redress the legacy of residential schools. Two of those calls were directed specifically at the Canadian archival profession, and in response to those one of those calls, uh, the Association of Canadian Archivists uh, recently released a report just kind of stating aspirationally that they would like to um, pursue those uh, initiatives. Um, so the two calls to action directed at archivists in the TRC calls to action, one was calling upon Library and Archives Canada, which is like the federal archival institution, to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other um, sort of international frameworks, um, which basically um, these frameworks sort of promise that, or kind of enshrine that indigenous communities have the right to like know what happened and to know what, to like to have access to the history, but also to have like, make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and so that question of access is particularly important to archives. Um, the second call to action directed at archivists was directed to the Canadian Association of Archivists, which does not exist because we are the Association of Canadian Archivists, so technically we don't have to do this. Um, I'm just kidding. But the, anyway, the Canadian Association of Archivists, whoever they are, have really been slacking, and so the Association of Canadian Archivists um, is going to try to pick up the slack. Um, and um, similarly, um, yeah, it's calling upon the ACA to be in compliance or to determine how compliant they are with UNDRIP um, and then to produce a report with recommendations for, for how to um, achieve these initiatives. And so with all of these things happening, a common themes in terms of reconciliation for archives specifically is providing indigenous, indigenous communities with better access to archives, um, reparative description of events of material, and imposing culturally appropriate access restrictions to material about indigenous communities containing sensitive information such as personal information and traditional knowledge. The uh, second um, framework that I want to discuss is just simply the framework of cultural humility. Um, the, there used to be um, popular the idea of cultural competence in library and information studies, the idea um, that you can just do like a better job of serving various communities. Um, and that's sort of been overturned a little bit by the idea of cultural humility, which recognizes that you can't really ever achieve like full competence in all different cultures, but what you can do is move through the world kind of doing your best, but also being open to criticism and feedback and just understanding that cultural humility is not about achieving competence, but about like lifelong learning and self-reflection and accountability and transparency with your practices. And the third um, framework is trauma-informed practice with which, so trauma, um, secondary trauma, trauma-informed practice really comes out of um, uh, different um, uh, professions, but originally really came out of things like social work or healthcare professionals who are experiencing um, what, was a, what was initially called like compassion fatigue, but what after was people realized that this compassion fatigue that people were experiencing was actually much more similar to just a trauma response. It would be a secondary trauma response, but um, witnessing horrible things actually has a similar effect on your brain to actually experiencing them yourself which is why it's called um, secondary trauma rather than compassion fatigue. And this is absolutely applicable to the context of records. So users of archives, but also archival professionals, um, deal with traumatic content in records, and that can be traumatizing. So trauma-informed practice means being aware of and mitigating these harms. That can be as simple as just making archival reading rooms much more pleasant to be in, because they have historically been extremely unpleasant to be in. Um, Library and Archives Canada, there are like, 
I mean, there are fees, you have to book appointments, you have to like travel long distances. There are like armed guards that search you. There are archivists that hover over you and make sure you don't steal anything. Um, and it can be very unwelcoming and that can be like quite traumatizing to, for example, indigenous communities who are like incurring huge costs just to like look at um, records that are like documenting their own communities. Um, reference services can also be more compassionate. Reference archivists are not always like the most compassionate people to deal with. If you email an archives requesting information, um, they can slap you with fees or forms to fill out or ID like requirements, and it can just be a lot more friendly. And um, you can also implement reparative archival description practices such as content warnings and updating language so that people who are encountering records of themselves or their communities who encounter like um, offensive language, um, there's a little bit more gentleness in terms of how those records are described. And of course, more support for users and practitioners from vulnerable backgrounds. Uh, so how are we for time? Actually, we're good for time. Case studies. First, I'll talk about my current workplace, which is the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Um, the center itself opened in 2018 as a West Coast partner to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which was itself established at the close of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, the center at UBC is mandated to address the colonial legacy of Canada's residential school system and other policies such as the 60s scoop imposed by the Canadian government on Indigenous peoples. What we do is we aggregate records related to the residential school system. We present them using sort of different, different from traditional, like uh, re uh, reparative and anti-colonial arrangement and description practices. So trying to present the records, like I said, in a little bit more gentle and trauma-informed way and also a more helpful way. Um, we provide research and reference support to residential school survivors and their families looking for records. Uh, we facilitate the recording of oral testimonies through a really cool oral testimony program where um, staff will go into communities with like recording equipment and just help communities or facilitate or just assist in whatever way with recording oral testimonies. And then there's a robust sort of legal framework whereby we don't promise that the communities can keep the recordings and then we keep them for ourselves in the university. We do the opposite of that, where we let the um, communities be in control of who is owning and having access to the recordings, um, which is not always what UBC has done. Uh, we provide resources and curated digital collections to support broader education and public engagement. So our primary mandate is to serve survivors and their families. Our secondary mandate is education and broader kind of public engagement. And then we facilitate policy dialogues among indigenous communities and archival institutions to advocate for better information practices. Um, so in terms of, I mentioned archival arrangement and description. Um, I mentioned previously that traditional archival practice is to arrange records according to creating agency. That can make it very difficult to search for records about yourself. Um, because if you as a person went to one school and then had one job and then went to a residential school and then a hospital or whatever. Um, records of you are gonna have been collected in various agencies and institutions and there's not gonna be any way that those are like indexed and there's like not gonna be a list anywhere of the uh, archival repositories that have records about you. It's all gonna be organized according to the creating institution. So what we do is with the records related to residential schools, we, um, use um, controlled vocabularies to make them searchable by school, by topic, by home communities of students, and all of those controlled vocabularies are developed in consultation with indigenous communities. So this is just a screenshot of the website where you can see the schools, uh, or the records uh, organized by school. We also have content warnings and explanatory notes flagging traumatic, propagandistic, or otherwise problematic content. Sorry for the lack of images. I'm not gonna put up images of traumatic content, but you can imagine. Um, and then we also, I mean, we're an archival repository, but we also collect museum and library items and different types of items for the purposes of supplementing colonial records with items representing survivor voices, such as oral testimonies and memoirs and other things not traditionally considered records. Um, and then we have a takedown request function where all of the stuff on the site um, 
anyone can request that something be taken down if they feel that there's sensitive information that, that people don't want up there. Although we get very few takedown requests because we try to like think first about not putting things up that people would not want up, but it's good to just have that function. And then archival reference services, which is maybe like my favorite part of the job, um, is uh, we have no fees or paperwork required to access reference services. The website just has a bunch of like functions to just like uh, leave a comment, ask a question, and that all just goes into reference. Um, and then we get all kinds of requests like, oh, I think my mom went to a residential school. I'm looking for records of her. Oh, I think my grandma was in Quebec in a residential school in the 40s. Like, I'm looking for a photograph. And any of those requests that we get, um, the reference team will do their best to track down records, even if those records are not in our own institution. So that's kind of rare for archival institutions. Normally, if you go to an archive, you can ask them if what they have in their archives, but they're not going to help you look at other archives. So what we do on the reference team is we will provide free reference and research services just for people who want to navigate the whole Canadian archival system. Um, case study number two I want to point to is Australia's Find and Connect resource, which similarly to the Residential School Dialogue Centre is sort of a post-custodial archival institution in the sense that they don't really hold their own records that are unique to them, but they aggregate records about Australia's um, child welfare system, specifically for the purpose of primarily serving um, care leavers, um, which is people who have experienced um, like being in foster care um, or kind of ch the child welfare system. They launched in 2011. They are funded by the Australian government. It's a team of archivists and historians and museum people. Um, as I said, they aggregate publicly available records. They also provide research and reference support to locate people's personal records. They don't put personal sensitive information up on the general website. Um, and they connect care leavers with support groups and services. The Residential School Dialogue Center does a similar thing with connecting people to resources. Um, they actually have a fully fleshed out historical language policy, which the Dialogue Center doesn't really have like a full policy, although we're like enacting different things in different ways. Um, but they have a really cool historical language policy developed in response to several issues encountered by the archivists. Um, one of the things they realized was um, that uh, our users are just encountering records in a completely different way than archival systems are designed to set up. Archival systems are designed to be completely hierarchical, where each record is in one place only. It's in, a record is in one file, which is in one series, which is in one phone. Um, but that is not how information is organized in the digital landscape. It's much more networked and relational. And people are just doing broad Google searches and they're just pulling up item level records um, rather than like going through the different hierarchical levels. Um, and what that means is um, users are encountering just items and item level description often missing important information. And so they, um, their language policy um, requires, oh, I'll get into that. Um, and then the other issue they encountered was that often it was unclear to users when archival description, so the metadata, was reproducing outdated historical language. It was unclear whether the archival institution was endorsing that language. So I won't, like, Basically, like the titles of like schools and things were like St. Mary's School for like flop children. That wasn't that's not a title, but um, that would be replicated in the metadata and um, you know using kind of offensive, outdated terms for um, uh, like mental illness or or different t types of things. And so um, it was just very unclear to people trying to navigate the records whether the language came from the original like, institution or whether the language came from the archivist. And so the historical language policy um, removed offensive language from document titles in the metadata and moved that offensive language to an archival reference note, obviously keeping it for findability and transparency, um, but replaced the titles in the metadata with more appropriate titles. Um, and then required archival description at multiple levels of the archival hierarchy. Third um, thing I want to talk about is UCLA Library Special Collections' reparative redescription project. Um, they, it's, um, 
a fairly large redescription project that UCLA Special Collections is embarking on. And their pilot project was in 2019 um, when they realized that they had a bunch of records related to incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II and their own descriptions, their own metadata that they had, so not the records themselves, but metadata that um, archivists had created, um, was full of euphemistic terms such as relocation center or internment to refer to incarceration centers. Um, and they wanted to update that terminology to reflect the preferred terminology stated in um, the Power of Words handbook from the Japanese American Citizens League. So they wanted to be in alignment with the stated language preferences of community representatives. Um, yes, as I said, this was a pilot project for um, UCLA LSC's CFPRT. Um, and yeah, it's part of a wider scale initiative for anti-oppressive redescription of archival holdings. And this is really interesting because um, it raises interesting questions. This, this article discusses it. This is also an excellent article about cultural humility, uh, humility as a framework. Um, this is a really interesting issue because when you are replacing outdated language with modern language, one obvious problem is that like someday the person um, replacing the language is going to be like the former archivist who was using outdated language because language changes and language preferences change. Um, and so I think this is a really good example of it not aiming for cultural competence in terms of, ah, we found the right word, we found the right language, but rather approaching this work from, uh, the perspective, from a framework of cultural humility in the sense of wanting to do right by the community putting in a good faith effort to choose language that's appropriate, and then also being transparent about where that language co came from. So in the archival description that was redone, they are transparent about the fact that they are using language that is the preferred terminology stated in the Power of Words handbook of the Japanese American Citizens League. And so I think this is a really good example of like, cultural humility in archival practice. And, um, and similarly, the Find and Connect resource and the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. I think a through line of these three institutions is not that they're doing everything perfectly, but that there's an attempt to do right by the communities that they're trying to serve and to also be transparent about the choices that they're making. And that is all I have. So at that, I am happy to take any questions. Yeah, Scott. Hello, Michael. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, <clears throat> I was just kind of, uh, when you were talking about the kind of uh, experience that you had in archives where you were kind of going around and there was the weird instance with the high security and stuff, and um, I was just kind of wondering how much you welcome like the di digitization of archives, because uh, I remember I studied history and when I found like an, uh, an online archive, I just praised the higher being because I didn't, I didn't have to go to Scotland or anything like that. But like, um, I was kind of wondering, yeah, how much you welcome that or if there are any issues you've encountered with digitization as well? There are, there are a variety of issues associated with digitization. Um, partly there is the um, question of access restrictions um, sometimes being appropriate. Um, the technical people in like the um, tech world um, tend to approach these things from a problem solving perspective of like, let's put everything online. Let's, you know, we can just have an open commons of everything being available to everyone. That's, um, that is problematic where things are going online that really shouldn't be seen by everyone. Like I said, sensitive information, um, culturally sensitive, uh, um, traditional knowledge, um, and so with all of these digitization projects, there are, I mean, there are issues around like legal compliance in terms of like what you can legally and cannot put um, online. Um, there are also ethical considerations. Um, uh, it's not in the slides, but um, specifically about um, protection of traditional knowledge that requires access restrictions. Um, there's a really cool um, content management system called Mukatu, M-U-K-U-R-T-U. I'm spelling that a little wrong. Um, 
uh, it's a content management system developed specifically for um, having like robust access restriction options for like traditional knowledge with indigenous communities. So it's a content management system where users have to like have um, a profile. They have, you have to make a profile which is going to collect certain information and then based on that profile certain things are going to be accessible to certain people and not accessible to other people. So there are definitely ways to design digital systems with um, care in terms of not just making everyone's stuff available to everybody. Then there are just practical considerations about like digitizing sometimes just means taking photographs of like handwritten letters that are not keyword searchable because it's a picture. Um, and so that is a kind of technical, technological challenge around like how to actually, I mean, Heritage Canadiana has a bunch of stuff online, but it's just like thousands and thousands of pages of just photographs of, of handwritten documents. And um, so there are practical issues, uh, legal compliance issues, ethical issues. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. And it was uh, very nicely structured also your talk. So you, uh, someone could notice that you are uh, working in archival practices. Um, um, I have a question about um, the uh, reformulating of titles mm -hmm. and uh, also the, the button, uh, put down request button. These are obviously very great for getting the feedback of the people who are documented, right? Otherwise, they may be silenced by the structures of the society. Um, but it could also be that uh, uh, if this is not regulated, but of course this is regulated because you, you're going to uh, work on this uh, or other people in, in these institutions are going to work on this if they are really putting this down or how they are reformulating this. But I could see it in this way that maybe if people are only... Uh, basically having their job to reformulate it in a, in a very um, um, not offensive way, mm -hmm. uh, that it's converging to a very, very inoffensive language and the actual history is, is basically, it's still transparent because the link is still there, but uh, having a person in charge also at the same institution where the person is in charge for, for making the language less offensive, to make it still transparent and, and to, uh, to make these transparency buttons also transparent <laughs> to the people. Um, do you see that this is kind of planned or do you see that it is one-sided only with reformulating instead of uh, showing the people what actually was there because it's very important for, for mm -hmm. our society to learn from what, what happened? Sure, I think, um, I think in terms of um, like, there are different approaches, and one of the main approaches still is to just not do anything, uh, and to just leave the language there. Um, so, and then in terms of like, what to do instead of not doing anything, as you said, um, there's the option to supplement the language with modern language, or there's the option to remove. Um, I think typically like archival institutions are leaning towards supplementing ex specifically for the purposes of transparency um, and uh, for the purposes of accountability and also findability. Um, because if you um, don't have the official names of things in your metadata, then people can't keyword search the metadata um, and so that really, that not only hurts just accountability in like an ethical sense, but just practical findability. So um, the offensive language really, for the most part, needs to stay in the metadata somewhere. Um, and I think in terms of um, like the ethics of going into the record and changing things, um, what we're seeing now in terms of people wanting to do reparative description is wanting to go into the record and change the, or into the metadata and change things, but for the purposes of transparency. So actually documenting, um, okay, this title in the metadata came from the record 
whereas this title was supplied by the archivist. And so, uh, so these practices of redescription, I think, are informed by a broader uh, desire to be more transparent rather than a desire to obscure the role of the archivist. And I think the previous archival practices that are associated more with like leaving the language in, um, you could look to those kind of previous practices and say that those were not guided as much by like an ethos of transparency in terms of archival processing. Where that's where people were going in and archival description was really informed by people's ideologies and um, kind of admiration of great men often kind of colored, uh, or like admiration of kind of great historical figures or, or of sort of uh, um, like, like military victories and the sort of uh, unproblematized admiration for historical figures often really colored archival description um, in ways that archivists weren't transparent about, whereas this kind of reparative description, like I said, is informed by broader desires to be more transparent. Um, so I think ideally you don't lose anything through this reparative description. It's just supplementing. And something I didn't really talk about or maybe kind of talked around is the idea that, I mean, we're just archivists. We can't rewrite the historical record. All you can do is really provide context and facilitate access. Um, so I think the important thing is not removing, <laughs> but providing context and being transparent about where that context comes from. Um, does that answer your question? Great. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes. Um, I had a quick clarification question, just um, one of the case study number two, Australia. My Australian history is not perfect, um, but I just noticed that it had mentioned that this, um, this archive project is focusing on, quote, a forgotten Australians and um, former child migrants. And to clarify, my understanding is that forgotten Australians refer to um, indigenous Australian indigenous peoples of what we now call Australia that were displaced um, and put through the welfare system. And then uh, the part that I wasn't as familiar with was, uh, does, was there something similar to what happened with forgotten Australians with child migrants in Australia? Is that why? Because it mentioned, it mentioned, I think it was on the slide before or after. Yeah, it said former child migrants. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not super familiar with this history, but I think what the connection is, is experience in like the care system, the care system. And I don't really know much more than that. I, I only know this history through the lens of archival processing. Um, but I would imagine that that's the connection is, is a history with, with the federal, or with the, with the um, government care system. I do have a second question just on the note of migrants, just because we, because you were mentioned talking about oral history and, and the importance of ha documenting oral testimony in the context of residential schools. Um, coming from a ref my, from a refugee community myself, um, you know, I know that for a lot of displaced persons, the, our access to you know libraries, archives, the things that we had to record our own histories gets severed. Um, and a lot of our experiences are no longer documented except in an oral history form. Um, that's the only mechanism, for example, that Palestinians have to our history. So do you know of any other um, things that, might, that Canada might be doing, um, particularly with displaced persons and trying to record oral histories in an archival sense? With displaced persons, I don't have a background in that. I have a, I've had a little bit of exposure to um, um, indigenous contexts, but in terms of um, migrant and displaced communities, I, I just don't have that background, I'm afraid. And then, can I ask one more? Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, just on the how you were, how, I just want to clarify how things get changed when you kind of update offensive language in the archival record. Because mm -hmm. um, in law classes and property, we were talking about um, discriminatory covenants in like land deeds. And these are basically little rules that are of no effect and legal effect now because they're stupid. But they basically will say things like, you know, you can't sell this except to a white man of good stock mm -hmm. or something really stupid like that. And, you know, Canada has decided, let's not have those anymore. They're stupid. So they're, they, but they still exist on the record. They're still on the deeds. And I know that the land registrar of BC has been working really hard to try to rem just like, remove them, but the way they remove them is they just 
kind of cross them. Like, you know, like where it's just like, it's, it's still there, you can still read it, but it's like lined out. So you kind of, so that someone can seeing it knows that it's no longer of effect. Is that similar to how like the changes work? I would say it's different in the sense that that strike through, I think it sounds like that's meant to uh, be like a substantive information about the meaning of the record, like in terms of like that actually has some weight um, in a different way than um, trying to approach like metadata with care and um, uh, an eye to trauma um, in the sense that I think using metadata to mitigate traumatic effects is not actually changing what the record means, if that makes sense. Or like, um, and so, like I said, it's more about transparency and context around, you know, if a title in the record is being replicated in the metadata, just being clear um, whether or not like the archival institution like uh, endorses that language. Um, but I would say that's different, I think, from what you're describing, which is actually going, uh, well, what's interesting, I would say that strike through is part of the record. Lynette, would you say that that is correct? That that strike through is part of the record, that's not metadata. Whereas what archivists can do and all archivists can do really is provide context through metadata and paradata and other kinds of things around the record. Thank you. Just wanted to offer some clarifying information about the former child migrants, if I may. Um, that was part of a process where um, orphan children usually from the UK would be sent to um, different countries in the Commonwealth um, in the foster care system. And then I had a question for you as well. Um, what is an unexpected challenge that you've come across in your work? Because obviously going in, you expect there's gonna be difficult histories and stories that you're interacting with, but what was something you didn't expect to have trouble with? Um, well, I didn't realize how much the secondary trauma was affecting me in the first months that I started working at the Dialogue Center. Um, I figured I knew that like, okay, obviously we're gonna be encountering difficult stuff. Um, but after a few months of working there, I just found certain effects like I was becoming more irritable with my friends and that triggered like triggered that prompted me to like actually see a counselor about like strategies for mitigating secondary trauma so it really creeps up on you like if you just find yourself just kind of like with less energy or less engaged in dinner conversation like sometimes that well, it turns out that's from reading really um tough stuff um I think also like you don't know what's gonna really hit you hard when you're like reading, when you're going through the records. Um, one thing that really floored me was, and I'm not gonna get graphic about details, um, but, well, I don't wanna, anyway. There's, there's difficult, there, yeah, there's difficult stuff and it's not always like the obvious stuff that really just kind of like hits you. Um, and what also surprised me was um, I think, you know, you, when you're on the reference team and you get a reference inquiry from someone saying, hey, my mom went to a residential school, can you help me find their records? Like, you're, you wanna be helpful and you're so excited to like do a good job and then um, like, you know, you're writing this long email about like, I looked at this institution and there was nothing. And then I looked at this other institution and there was nothing. And you as like the archivist person who's like excited to do your job, you're like, um, sometimes you have to like check yourself that um, like, okay, I'm overloading this person with information or I'm going into the nuances of like, oh, this was called this by this institution, but then the name changed when it, you know, like sometimes they don't care. And also often they see you as part of the system and part of the colonial system. And that's not wrong of them. Like, I'm not saying that's a misconception, but sometimes nuances around like, okay, we at the Dialogue Center are not the NCTR or we're not Library and Archives Canada or like we don't have the records you're looking for and we aren't responsible for having the records you're looking for. 
Um, sometimes those nuances, like to the person who's just like looking for stuff about their family, they're like, what are you talking? It doesn't matter. And, and in a sense, they're right, because this is like, we are partnered with all of these different colonial institutions, and we are part of UBC. And so to me, like that desire to be transparent and help and like show also is in tension with like just the fact that, you know, you can try your best to be transparent, but you also can't control how that's going to read to the other person. And sometimes the person's just going to be like, give me my thing I'm looking for. And like, <laughs> that's okay. Like that's not, um, they don't need to come to this space with a particular affective response. Like we are just like here to help. Yeah. What about you? Did you, what, cause you also work there. <laughs> you don't have to say if you don't want. <laughs> Sorry to sort of co-op this. Um, I work primarily in research, so I have a bit of a different perspective. But for me, the difficulty is in the lack of records oftentimes because a lot of them were destroyed or are not being shared by the institutions that hold them, such as uh, religious organizations. So trying to balance accessing these records and also as you said, the transparency of saying like, I'm sorry, but we can't show you that you were at this school because the government destroyed the records. Sorry. Yeah, like how can there be no records of someone's 10 year long attendance at a school 50 years ago? Like it's. Yeah. It's, so for example, in reference, sometimes you get emails like, I know my mother went to a school in Ontario in the 1910s. Can you tell me more? And I'm like, no, I can't. I'm sorry. Um, but here's how we can facilitate more learning and support. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Lynette. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just thinking how to formulate uh, my question. Yeah, so um, thank you for your talk, Michael. It's great to hear about what you're kind of up to. Um, my question is about like the interaction between artificial intelligence and the. <laughs> this was kind of inspired by Alejandro, um, as you might be able to tell. But um, what is the inter interaction between artif artificial intelligence and the archi archival studies at the moment? Can it help um, to kind of facilitate these kind of instances where you have like a lack of good records? Is it? I, do you do you fear for? Archival, archival practices with the artificial intelligence. Like, what are the what are the kind of pros and cons in your in your view? Thank you for that question. Um, are archivists and librarians obsolete because of technological advances? In some ways, yes. In the sense that a lot of what archivists and librarians used to do is now doable by computers. However, archivists and librarians are also positioned to have more of like an information policy role in these changing landscapes of technology advancing so quickly and the people designing the technology typically being most interested in like what it can do. Um, and so there's an important role for information professionals, not necessarily like data scientists or tech people, but like information professionals as um, people who have more of like a theoretical understanding of like principles around what kind of information should be documented, what kind of information should have access controls. Um, for example, um, like Alejandro and you and I were talking about, like these days you can just ask an AI tool to write a research article for you. Well, um, and like currently, Alejandro mentioned like that someone tried it and then the AI tool was like, no, I won't, it's unethical. <laughs> um, and like that's the state right now, but that could change in terms of like the tech people and the technical affordances. Those are always changing. But what archivists and records managers and librarians can do is be in the role of saying like, okay, well, when AI tools are being used, what kind of metadata or paradata should be documented in order to document those processes? Um, and that is what I do in my other job. So in addition to working at the Dialogue Center, I'm a research assistant on a project called Inter Paris and Lynette's as well, um, which is, um, it's, been, it's an international project that's been housed out of UBC since like the late 90s or early 2000s. And it's records management and AI and electronic records and like developing standards and best practices for uh, implementing AI in government record keeping. 
So that is things like AI has been implemented to alleviate the burden of like huge amounts of electronic records and government record keeping. So medical records, which are very structured, you can train AI tools to like um, anonymize personal information in things like structured records. That is much more challenging, although it's starting to happen in things like unstructured data, like legal records. Um, legal records, just narrative accounts of people's um, disputes have to be made available, like there are legal requirements, but then like the burden of like going through and manually redacting information is like hugely difficult. So there are AI tools being trained to do things like that. The issue, of course, is that the retention or the um, accuracy, what is it, precision and recall, I, like the tools are at like 90%, which is just not enough. <laughs> like you can't have 90% precision and recall for like putting, making government documents available that have been like anonymized. Um, AI is great in commercial contexts in terms of targeting people for what kind of ads you should send them because the scale is so big that you don't need 100% accuracy or precision or recall. But in government record keeping context, there's a duty to the citizens, which makes um, current precision and recall numbers just not good enough. So often that means you can use the AI tool, but then you just need human review after, although that can be problematic as well, as we've seen with like AI has been used in like U.S. court decision making to um, uh, and like judges have like cited in their judgments that they have like been influenced by like AI tools designed to determine someone's like uh, likelihood to recommit crimes. And it, I mean, there's a lot of data that that's like it's the tool is super racist. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, AI is being explored in record keeping context just because like, there's such a huge volume of records that it's just it's got to speed up a little. And so then there, you have archivists and information professionals just thinking about what are the standards and practices that need to be in place. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's a great answer. Um, the technology is constantly evolving, but I'm hearing like it can be useful, but you also have to document how it's being used and to make sure like the metadata exists in that instance as well. So yeah, yeah thanks. We have time for a last question. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, you mentioned human-centered kind of thing, and that had me thinking about, you know, archive. I've never been to an archive before. Um, like the physical experience you discussed a little bit, how does the dialogue center uh, differ from, say, Library and Archives Canada? And I think, are they building a new building um, as well for They are Ottawa? a new building. Uh, no, sorry, oh. Library and Archives Canada. Are I they? don't know. Okay. Maybe they need more space. I thought, I thought maybe they were, but um, yeah, I was wondering what, like, how does it differ from a library? You know, like a good human-centered physical and, you know, staffing-wise, like how does a good archive look? Uh, yeah. That's a great question. This is just a photo of the Dialogue Center. Um, it was designed by um, Alfred Waugh, who is the first Indigenous graduate of UBC's architecture masters. Um, and it was designed deliberately for the context of residential school survivors. So it's like all glass. It's very open to kind of um, be an antithesis to the experience of being in a residential school. Um, but there is um, so Partly in terms of design, like you can, I mean, it's like I said, there's just genuinely, like it can be as simple as trying to make the spaces pleasant to be in and open and airy and not having things like um, really burdensome um, gatekeeping kind of restrictions on who can go in. Um, and that can be concrete in terms of like not requiring like ID and paperwork and fees, um, but also it can be, um, more, um, less concrete in the sense of just a friendlier demeanor on the part of the staff. And I think that's something libraries do much better. Librarians are so, <sighs> can be very proud of the status of libraries as like the last bastion of like free public space, um, which, you know, they're rightfully proud of like how important libraries are. <laughs> um, 
uh, in that regard, like they lo- like they take pride in it being a public space that's open to anyone. You can come in and just use the washroom. You can come in and use a computer. Um, you don't have to be like a, their ideal of a researcher. And I think archives could learn a lot from that ethos of like we are for the public. Yeah, I sorry that's kind of vague. I don't know if I added more than yeah. Well, thank you very much, Michael.